I will start with an example. I won't take the name who it is, but it is an actual example, not a story. Uh, there was a spiritual guru who was, I won't say was very, very, very popular, but he, he is somewhat popular now. Maybe in that, those times also, he was somewhat popular. And one of the, one of his disciples, or even if not disciple, one of his followers, I saw him make this statement recently. Uh, when somebody raised this question to that follower, what are the, what are the qualities of a guru or how can we decide who is genuine guru and who is not? When that question was asked, that man answered saying, I mean, he said many things, but one of the main things he said was, uh, if somebody is charging money, you can rule that, rule, rule him out. He can't be genuine. Like he categorically made a statement. And he explained why. So he gave the example of this particular teacher. That teacher is no more. So he gave the example of this particular teacher. I will tell you how that particular teacher used to conduct his spiritual sessions. And then I'll ask you some questions. So how this spiritual, spiritual teacher used to conduct his uh, spiritual sessions, satsangs, is that he would go from place to place. He would go to places to his uh, disciples' places and conduct satsangs there. So the arrangement was, whoever calls him, you know, maybe in a different city or in the same city or whatever, whoever calls him to conduct the satsang, one day, two day or whatever that is, whoever calls him to conduct satsangs, that teacher will put a condition saying, I will come, I will conduct the satsangs. But whoever wants to come can come and nobody should be charged money. You have to make all the arrangements, whoever is calling them, whoever is trying to host the satsang, they should make all the arrangements. They should arrange for the travel of the teacher. They should arrange for uh, his accommodation, food. And if people are called and if, if needed for their food also, their whatever, all these arrangements, the host has to make. And nobody should be charged money. Whoever wants to come and attend should be able to attend. That used to be his condition. And he used to go around to some places and conduct satsangs like this. So this man who is uh, his follower or disciple was giving this example and telling, so this is how it should be. And he never charged money from anybody. So he, is, he has come to the conclusion that whoever charges money can't be genuine. A genuine one will not charge money. He would keep it open for whoever comes to attend, can come and attend. Now, do you see that money is not absent there? Somebody is finally paying for it, whatever it is. There is a host. The host is making all the arrangements willingly. They are willingly making all the arrangements. So the condition is that nobody should be charged for entry fees or whatever. So whatever charges are involved, whether it is uh, arranging a hall or whatever, any kind of money finally is being paid by somebody, isn't it? Money is not absent. So in this case, the arrangement is quite simple. Maybe one or two people are hosting him and are bearing all the expenses in more and nobody else is being charged. Okay. So he was telling, he was giving this example and telling 
this is fine this is how it should be but if you charge money from people who come that's not genuine now what is happening in this particular arrangement one or two disciples who have the ability to sponsor it are sponsoring but suppose those one or two people uh see if one or two people maybe whatever they are affluent or whatever they can afford they are affording but still it has a limit isn't it they can arrange maybe for 100 more people 100 more people can come for free and attend and go maybe they can afford that much but what if somebody gets this desire that why only 100 people we should be able to arrange a very big hall where 1000 people can come and we should be able to uh make this available for more people but i don't have that i can't afford that much by myself so maybe some few disciples will get together maybe let's say 10 people will get together pull in more money afford a bigger hall make bigger arrangements maybe even be able to reach out to more people through whatever means and make make more people come to know that this particular teacher is coming you can come and attend and they will make it a little more elaborate so now because of 10 people coming together they are able to conduct the same thing now it is just magnified instead of conducting it for 100 people in a small place or a house they are able to do it in a larger place for 1000 people still nobody is being charged but 10 people are sponsoring it money is still involved earlier money was involved and two people were paying now money is still involved 10 people are paying for it if that is fine this also should be fine yes if the first arrangement is fine the second one also should be fine it is just you are making it a little more elaborate so that it is available for more people hmm? yes now instead of 10 people coming together and doing it see for if it is a small group of people like this 10 people coming together they can coordinate and make it happen but suppose somebody gets a bigger desire oh we should be able to reach out to more more people much more people why 1000 the whole city should know they may have a bigger desire but now it is not easy to bring people who would sponsor see 10 people bringing them together and making the sponsoring and arranging is easier but now i want to make it very big i want to be able to reach out to more people at least it should be made available whether they will really come or not mm. is not my point so somebody wants to reach out to more and more people but now it's not very easy for uh, whoever wants to sponsor to come together now maybe you will need need thousand sponsors to pull in all the resources to make it happen in a uh, much big way so what they will do is they will make an arrangement saying whoever wants to give money can give others can come for free so now maybe a thousand people will give money and because of thousand people giving money maybe it is being made available to 10000 people or even more so if the first arrangement is fine this also is logically fine it is still the same arrangement being magnified that's all why this kind of notion has come up it has come up especially probably in indians i don't know about other countries this notion of um, spiritual sessions spiritual teachers not taking money our money not being involved with spiritual teachers this notion has come because in in the traditional setting since ancient times in india that's how it it was running and that was how it was supposed to be but what people overlook is that money was ultimately involved somebody was sponsoring it it was not happening for free in the sense of money not being involved nothing can be done without money being involved 
if they are in a society and trying to reach out to people. So just from this fact that in ancient India, spiritual teachers were not charging money or money was not involved with them. Just because of that particular fact, people come to the conclusion that money was not even involved, which is wrong. What used to happen is that kings or some businessmen or whatever the affluent part of the society were sponsoring it. You can look at Buddha's story and list to see how it was running. Wherever Buddha went, in most of the places at least, kings sponsored. They gave acres and acres of land for his, him and for his monks to stay and they even built buildings. They gave robes, they gave begging bowls, they sponsored all of it, the kings. Whatever arrangement Buddha was running, he was mainly uh, running a Sangha with monks. That was his arrangement. But whatever monks required was being sponsored by kings or some of the affluent people of the society. So it was not being run for free. Or even if you take other teachers, you will know. So ultimately, somebody is bearing the expenses. That we have to keep in mind. There is always some generous sponsor in the ancient times and they, they were the ones who made sure that things happened for the seekers as well as the teacher. So there were seekers who were undergoing or attending the sessions or becoming part of that organization for free. They were not paying, but for them, somebody was paying finally. And not just sponsors like that, even general public used to support them. They used to beg for food from general public only and public used to feed them. It is just that today this whole arrangement is not running as it is. Today times have changed. Uh, but the arrangement, the essential arrangement has not changed and that's what people are not taking notice of. The essential arrangement has still remained. There are always, in any spiritual organization, there are always a group of people who are sponsoring and there are always people who are undergoing it for no charge. There is always. Just because that ancient arrangement has become more organized and more amplified, it doesn't become invalid by itself. Why I'm telling this is people, when they talk against this, they talk as if this whole arrangement itself is invalid. It must be free for everybody. That is the tone in which they speak. For example, see now, now I am not conducting sessions for money as of now. I am not charging money. But suppose I do announce a class and I put it on Facebook. Suppose I conduct a class for a fee. Some people will immediately comment. They will not realize <laughs> that in ancient times, somebody would have sponsored me. Are they willing to sponsor for me? Then I will do it for free for others. If somebody are willingly coming, okay, I will sponsor for 10 people. Then I will not charge money for 10 people. I will do it for free because there ultimately some money will be involved. To say, I want spiritual teaching for free, I will pay for everything else, I will pay for a movie, I will pay for this, I will pay for that. Only spiritual teaching give me for free is an illogical argument. Everything finally <laughs> involves money. Somebody has to pay the expenses. Just because the same arrangement happens in a large scale, it doesn't become a business immediately. We cannot, it ne does not necessarily become a business. There may be people who are trying to exploit this arrangement and trying to go after money. That is always there in everything. But the main thing I'm pointing out is the arrangement by itself can't be invalidated. So we can't say that only if spirituality is happening in small to small pockets, like the example I was giving, that's that particular guru or spiritual, that master uh, he was not trying to reach out to thousands of people. He was just going from one place to another, conducting small satsangs for maybe 50, 100 people. 
So if you say only that is genuine, only one, one or two people are sponsoring. So it is happening in small pockets. Only if spirituality happens in small pockets, in humble places, it is genuine. If it happens in large scale, it is not genuine. It is an illogical argument. Just because it increases in scale, it doesn't become a business necessarily. Uh, so this is the essential point. Of course, there will be a lot of things to it. The very dynamics of the society has changed over centuries. So many things have changed and there will be too many other factors also that have come in. I am pointing out only the essential factor. See, for example, there is this, in, in today, there is this something called NGO. And NGOs, there are so many provisions through which they can earn their own money. It's not illegal. Like when we say NGO, people have this notion that the only source of income for an NGO is donations. It is not true. There are many other sources of income which are legal, meaning they can sell products, they can do many things, earn money so that they can do more service work. Meaning, they may sell things to people who can afford it, make a profit and use the profit for service. It is still valid just because they sell a product an NGO doesn't become a business immediately. So anyway, like this, there are too many other things. The dynamics of the society, our economics, the very idea of organizing itself is new. Building an organization, building corporations, large scale corporations, is itself new, such things didn't exist few centuries ago. It existed maybe some kind of informal organizations existed, but apart from the government of the king, if we didn't have, for example, business companies, there were only businessmen. They didn't have large scale organization, business chains all across the country and all that didn't exist. So this very idea of organizing large groups of people, pooling in resources and conducting things at large scale is a recent phenomenon. What is the problem in doing it for spiritual process also? The whole thing is a new phenomenon. Why are we telling only spirituality should be conducted as to how it was conducted 10 centuries ago? Everything else has to be conducted in modern, in modern way. Even spirituality can be conducted externally, whatever like, arrangements have been made, whatever developments have come, the more take, there is no problem in taking the model itself. You can't say it becomes invalid just because it becomes large scale and magnified in its operation. So we can't say only if spiritual groups are running their ashram as to how it was running in 2000 BC. That's how it has to run now also. I would say it is stupid, that's all. 